the relationship we have with the government is changing. Our demands for transparency are significantly higher than they were in the past. Our demands for oversight, checks and balances are significantly higher. We're no longer just tolerating an inequality or inequity. We're now saying, hey, the world needs to work differently. And the problem is there's a tool deficit. The tools of democracy and republics and communism and all these systems of the 20th century and before, they're not sufficient for what people actually want. And what we're starting to realize, blockchain is just not about money. It also has the potential to really redefine our relationship with our government, with our businesses, and with each other. We tend to think of these things only in terms of the price or technological capabilities. And that uh, is blind to the amazing social power of belonging to a system where we really are starting to have a conversation about how should we live in the 21st century. Dear crypto community and blockchain blades across the globe, welcome back to Kryptonites, the no BS blockchain channel built with the community and for the community. And today we have another mind-blowing guest, the co-founder and CEO of IOHK, the gentleman behind Cardano, the researcher, the engineer, the mathematician. And today we're going to cover some amazing topics such as third generation blockchains, the emerging technologies that are going to change the blockchain space forever. Of course, Cardano and the ADA coin as well. So don't forget to stick until the very end. You will learn tons of cool stuff. And before we start, two things, guys. Number one, don't forget to look into the Cardano Virtual Summit 2020 on July 2nd and 3rd. There are going to be some great panelists, great discussions and updates on the Cardano project. But also download the Swissborg Wealth app, the Skyscanner 2.0 of crypto, allowing you to get best rates when you buy and sell your crypto directly in your local currency. So without further ado, Charles Hoskinson, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, thank you so much for the high praise. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for being on the show, um, Charles. It means a lot. And there's a lot of excitement behind Cardano these days and Ada and a lot of the things that you guys are doing with Shelly. So I'm really looking forward to diving deep into those specifications, but also would love to kick off with something more high level picture, the big picture, if that's okay with you. Sure, sure. About Shelly and Cardano. Yeah, so uh, we're getting to the end of the road for the first generation of the uh, of the work. You know, we, uh, we took a contract in 2015 uh, with kind of an open mandate to build the Ethereum of Japan. And uh, we transformed that to the first true third generation cryptocurrency. And we kind of broke down the work streams into three different domains. Uh, one was scalability, one was interoperability, and one was sustainability. And so basically we wanted a system that would get faster or stay at the same performance as it gained more users. Uh, it, you know, there's certain systems that do this like BitTorrent, for example, and uh, those are tremendously scalable. You can get hundreds of millions of users or billions of users. So he said, wouldn't it be really cool if we had like a financial operating system that had that same property? Second, uh, you know, the reality is we live in the Internet of value, an Internet of blockchains. We live in a situation where there are thousands of cryptocurrencies and there's dozens of very prominent financial systems all around the world. So it's not going to be the situation where everything just gets replaced with one standard, but rather you need to be able to talk to many different standards. So interoperability is super important, the ability to move information and value between systems. And then finally, sustainability is kind of a catch-all for the who pays and who decides problem. So if you're building open infrastructure, the problem with that is that you don't have a custodial entity. Normally there's always that Microsoft to Windows or Google to Android or you know uh, Apple to the iPhone phenomena. Well, here we have an issue where no one's gonna control it, no one's gonna own it. So then who makes the decisions or how do decisions get made for the system to evolve and for the system to be able to pay for its maintenance upgrades and scale? Uh, so if you get it wrong, you end up with the Bitcoin caches and the Ethereum classics and so forth. So this was kind of the high level aspirational set of goals that we had back in 2015. And what occurred was that we slowly but surely built an army of scientists and engineers and we adopted some very rigorous uh, patterns to try to address these problems. We, we use first principles thinking, we use peer review, we use formal methods. 
and we publish more than 60 papers, uh, a lot of which have actually survived the rigors of peer review at the moment. Uh, and uh, we've also written probably more than a million lines of code across all the different source bases we have. We probably have 30, 40 repos now in the, uh, the IOHK GitHub. Uh, so we learned a lot along the way, we, and we kind of uh, converged to a vision of how to build a system that has these properties or can evolve into these properties, and how to build a system that's truly going to be here to last. So we, we learned a huge amount from the permission space, like the fabrics of the world. We learned a lot from Bitcoin. We learned a lot from Ethereum. We wrote our own programming languages. We uh, upgraded Bitcoin's accounting model to the extent of the TXO model. We found a more abstract and generic way of describing ledgers in general. Uh, and we wrote formal specs for those. We figured out how to actually build a wallet properly. We solved uh, a lot of things like UTXO fragmentation along the way. So we, uh, my uh, chief architect of this, uh, Duncan Coots, he describes it as fixing broken windows. You know, you're kind of renovating a mansion and you discover all these broken windows and squirrels and raccoons. You have to kick them out of the room and repaint things. And now finally, we're converging to a point where Cardano is going to upgrade from a federated and... Um, static system to a dynamic and decentralized system, which is basically controlled by the community as a whole. And we've been in this upgrade process since December. We started the incentivized test net. It was just a small thing. And then we ended up having 1,200 stake pool operators. We had 19,000 validating nodes. It's full peer-to-peer. -peer. It's fully decentralized to a point where even if we wanted to kill the ITN, we can't. It's its own thing now. Uh, and we uh, used that set to basically get a bunch of pioneers to help us bootstrap the launch of uh, Shelly, which is the upgrade that goes to dynamic and decentralized. So we'll be releasing that software here in a few, uh, in a week or two. And then the hard fork will happen July 29th and August 18th. The first blocks by the community be, will be made on uh, mainnet. So it's a massive milestone. And we've built a great community. You know, we have probably... 100,000 people now, I think, in the Reddit and the Telegram groups combined. And there's been hundreds of thousands of downloads of Daedalus and Uroi throughout the years. And we have massive amounts of, uh, of people who are aware of the project. And we're, of course, performing quite well in the markets and uh, the mind share of people. Everybody knows who we are, you know, and people are very excited about where this project is going to go. It's uh, pretty remarkable to see how far we've gone from being on a whiteboard with this, let's do the Ethereum of Japan idea to basically the first true third generation cryptocurrency and realizing that with rigor. That's incredible. Yeah. Congratulations on the massive milestone. And obviously this summit, which has an incredible list of speakers and panels, we'll put a link below. And I would love to ask you, like Charles, in terms of communicating this to my grandma, Susie, in really layman terms. And by the way, your video with the whiteboard back in the day about Cardano was absolutely amazing, perfectly put. And I think it will go down as one of the legendary videos in the future once the blockchain space becomes more uh, ready for mass adoption. But I remember you talking about multiple generations of blockchains. Is it correct to say that you know Bitcoin was a first gen, smart contracts with Ethereum was a second gen, and then Cardano is the third generation, which you talked about uh, interoperability, sustainability, and scalability were those kind of the three main generations that uh, that yeah. existed in your yeah because because you have to solve problems along the way to get to a point where you actually can be useful for grandma you know so the first very the very first problem that had to be solved was this concept of can you even build a decentralized ledger and have it be maintained by a community instead of a central entity you know so all these prior attempts like digicash and other things. Uh, they worked as long as you had a trusted third party to hoist them up. So there was always this idea of some federated group of actors or a central company or a government that basically owned the ledger, managed the ledger, or was required to make the system work. And then suddenly you had some idea come out there and say, oh, no, 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 uh, anybody can run it and we're all equal and uh, it's open participation and, and we have no idea who's going to actually run it, but somehow it'll just all work and it'll end up being more secure and better performant. Uh, than, uh, than if you had a central ledger. You're like, wow, that's a pretty crazy idea. Oh, and by the way, we're going to have these crazy tokens that are backed by nothing. And one day people are going to treat them so with so much value uh, that they'll, they'll pay $10,000 for them. It's like that was an insane concept. But that's what Bitcoin basically proved. And uh, the, you know, Satoshi got a lot right there. The problem is Bitcoin is blind, deaf, and dumb. You know, it uh, it can't see the outside world. Uh, it doesn't. It's very difficult to communicate with if you're you know trying to layer on a different system, and the transactions are very simplistic. 
So you can't do things like issue your own asset or do a domain name registry service or do an identity management service or uh, like write state channels and things that they want to do like lightning. They take a huge amount of time and you have to kind of work with the system. You know, there were people who are actively trying to make Bitcoin better and out of months and months and months, if not years of frustration, they gave up and said, okay, we need a, a different system. So it's almost like when JavaScript came to the web browser, you know, suddenly you went from these static not very interesting web pages to experiences like YouTube and Facebook and Google because you could finally program the experiences. So similarly, programmable transactions came to the blockchain and Ethereum really proved that that's a viable model and people want that. The problem is that model doesn't work at scale. So as you go from thousands to millions to billions of people, it just kind of disintegrates. Second, that model doesn't have a lot of things built into it to make interoperability easy. You kind of have to reinvent the wheel every single time you want to plug in some form of a system. And uh, sometimes it's very expensive to do that. You know, basic things like privacy, night falls like $5 a transaction, you know, these types of things. Uh, they're, they're not so easy. So you, you end up having this... Um, over abstraction, they're kind of too far in that respect. And then finally on sustainability, Ethereum has no blockchain-based governance system. So uh, it doesn't have a treasury, it makes no accommodations for that. So it's not clear who will pay for development if the Ethereum foundation is not around. And they say, well, maybe we can do a Linux foundation model or something like that. But then you run back into the patronage model where he who has the gold makes the rules. So you don't really have decentralized development. You basically have a consortium, an, an oligarchy of corporations that decide the direction, focus, and roadmap of the uh, of the project. And if you like that, well, you know you can use Hyperledger Fabric, you can use Sawtooth. Uh, those projects exist. But if you want to be truly decentralized, you really need an alternative funding source for long-term research and development. And then finally, you need to get consent of people like. If you want to be resistant to quantum computers, there's a dozen different approaches you can take. Which one's the right one? And they all carry trade-offs. Uh, should we make the system private by default, accepting that we'll lose liquidity in certain markets, probably South Korea and Japan and so forth? Is that okay? You know, these are difficult philosophical questions as much as they are technological questions. So who gets to decide? A bunch of core developers who have GitHub commit access and They've decided to meritocratically elect themselves as the uh, philosopher kings of the system, or maybe the holders of the token, or maybe somebody else. So it's not clear, and every time you get it wrong, you end up with a classic or a uh, cash version of yourself. And you can only survive so much of that before you destroy adoption, because grandma's not going to know the difference between 12 different forms of the same token and what is an airdrop. They want stability in these systems. Uh, so third generation is a lot harder. You kind of have an order of magnitude, more complexity and emergent problems as you go from generations. So Bitcoin was really a simple system, and most of the heavy lifting had to be done by social dynamics and work. And then Ethereum is a much more complicated system. It's an order of magnitude more complicated. And that's why you have the DAO hacks and every hard fork, they have to do stuff with gas and so forth, because there's just so many more dimensions of freedom that have to be played around with. And then when you go to the third generation where you're saying, oh, by the way, as people use it, it gets faster. It talks to everything. Oh, and yeah, we solved all these democracy problems. That's a lot harder because it's both technologically harder and it's harder from a social dynamics viewpoint. So it's really an ambitious project to uh, chase these things. And you're kind of boiling the ocean in a certain respect. And you have to approach it with humility. And you also have to approach it with an open mind. Uh, this is why uh, academia was such a strong part of this, because we wanted to have a decentralized brain. You know, we wanted to bring the best and brightest scientists in the world. And we did that with over 60 papers and tens of thousands of citations. Uh, so overall, um, I'm very happy with the way things have materialized, um, but it, uh, it just shows you that these things are not simple by any sense of the word. And the problem is that uh, you, it's easy to make a mistake and it's easy to regress or it's easy to have an incomplete system. Um, the example I like to use is, uh, you ever watch The Simpsons? Of course, yeah, huge fan. Yeah. There's an episode where Mr. Burns decides to turn the power off uh, for Springfield. And so to do that, he has to go to the center of the power plant. And he goes through all these elaborate series of tunnels and face scanners and secret rooms and so forth. And he finally gets to the center of the plant to turn off the power. And there's this dog that's sitting in the room. And you see this rickety old wooden screen door that leads to the outside. Uh, and so you're like, well, what's the point if you have this back door that leads into the center of the plant to go through this elaborate series of tunnels? And that's usually what ends up happening with system architecture for a lot of these things, where you get some things right, 
and you end up uh, going through all those tunnels and it seems secure, it seems to work. And then when you finally turn the system on, you discover the rickety screen door that leads to the outside world and you have the rabid dog that uh, that's in there that you kick out. Uh, so uh, there's numerous examples of that throughout the history of the space. So to do everything right holistically is super, super hard. And to do that right at scale and do that right with millions of users, it's a, it's a big challenge. And that's why Cardano gets a lot of admiration for its, uh, its audacity to approach these things. It's a huge achievement for us. A lot of admiration indeed. And a lot of people, you know, you mentioned the many key words that I think the community has really kept with them. Uh, and there's one question which is regarding the whole research-based or research approach and academia and academics and all these things that really, you know, the community loves. If you don't mind telling me throughout these 60 papers that you guys wrote, what is one of the best findings through, through your research? And I know you've been doing this, I believe, since 2013 in terms of setting up these research labs. But what is, the, what, what is one of the most fascinating findings so far for you, Charles? Well, in the beginning, we didn't know if proof of stake actually worked or not. You know, the Bitcoin space, the proof of work people, it's almost a religion at this point. And they're firmly convinced there is only one God and it's proof of work. And all other gods are false gods. Uh, so proof of stake was a really difficult one because it, you had to actually rigorously define what you wanted to accomplish. So proof of stake been out since 2011, pure coin, and then NXT came out. And there was a lot of attempts to, to get this right. But we didn't have a formal security definition of, well, what does it even mean and what properties are we trying to replicate? Uh, that was the first major challenge of the project. So we uh, Agalos wrote the GKL model with Nico Leonidas and um, Juan Gray. Uh, so that was the GKL, uh, Gray, Chiasis, Leonidas. Uh, but uh, anyway, basically what they did is they rigorously modeled what a secure ledger is and they created definitions for it and they kind of talked about what proof of work effectively accomplishes with that. So at least that gave us a target for comparison. We say, okay, if you're actually going to build proof of stake, then your proof of stake protocol ought to do all these things that proof of work does. And that led to a five-year journey with more than six papers, soon to be nine, over and over again, religiously just chipping away one after another uh, of these security properties to get adaptive security and bootstrap from Genesis and the right synchrony model and uh, and so forth. And then what, just getting the security properties wasn't good enough. You actually had to build all the economic side of the world and figure out, well, how do you actually create a stable system with proper incentives? So we had to open a lab at Oxford and we worked with Elias Kasupas, a br brilliant professor there. And we wrote several papers on kind of how to create a stable system with stake pools and delegation and all these other things. So that whole research line kind of built out the corpus of how to write a consensus protocol in general for a cryptocurrency, which is why they're among the most cited papers in the entire, in the entire cryptographic space and system space for cryptocurrency research. Whether people like them or not, they cite them because they're just good science and uh, the results are wonderful. We have at this point replicated all the security properties of Bitcoin that matter, but do so with a system that's stable at 10 kilowatts of power with a thousand state pools and uh, much better performance and a lot of extensibility. And also by having a delegation class, a uh, state pool class, gives us a hook for cross-chain communication, for other services to be offered, like Oracle services or DEXs or, you know, the, or things to bootstrap MPC circuits. So it's a much more robust design than what Proof of Work provides, much more sustainable design, and one that leads to not only great performance, but performance without using more power than the entire country of Ecuador or, or uh, Venezuela or, you know, Switzerland. So... It has all the benefits that Bitcoin has, and it, it kind of eschews a lot of the downsides that the Ethereum count model has. But you can issue tokens with it. You can actually talk to other blockchains with it. You can issue, you know, create layer two solutions like Hydra, you know, state channel stuff with it. So it does everything you'd really want. But it was also designed from the ground up to have uh, off-chain compatibility. So you can easily talk to off-chain code and it has the ability to bridge that. So you can write your Java server or your Node server or your C++ server and have that talk to a Plutus smart contract natively. So that was another one of the crown jewels is the opening up of the smart contract side 
from the, hey, let's just try to fix this broken Ethereum model and try to monkey patch all the things that they've done wrong to, hey, let's actually from first principles write a proper smart contract programming language in a very rigorous way with extremely respected academics behind it. So there's a big incentive for that world to play with it. You know, not to come off as like an ivory tower or something, but you know, there is something to say about opening up and making it socially acceptable for the academic world to pay attention to you. You know, in, in, for cryptographers, until Addy Shamir started writing papers on Bitcoin, it was kind of like, eh, I don't know if we'll even give you the time of day. But Addy is such a big guy. He's got the Turing Award. You know, he's the S in RSA. So when he started talking about it, everybody's like, oh, okay, yeah, it's acceptable now to do Bitcoin research. So similarly, when you have these foundational opening pieces of work, what they do is they create hooks that other academics can see and, and understand and say, oh, yeah, if I do work there, I can get into conferences. People are going to pay attention to it. This is good for me and for my students. And so that's what we always aspire to do with our, our research. It wasn't research for the sake of research or industrial research for a one-off product, but it was more like rewrite the science of our entire industry so that we can bring a large tenth of people in. And 20 years later, people will still be doing this work with or without us with or without our funding. And so that means that we always have great ideas that are percolating up that we kind of get at a very low cost because they're subsidized in the, uh, the research community. And thank you so much, Charles, for being the catalyst of that. I think it's really important that you're getting so many important people involved in this space so that it's, like you said, sustainable. And I have a question. And just to put on, you know, devil's advocate cap when it comes to the proof of work evangelists, as you were saying, you know, a lot of them tell me, hey, Alex, you know, uh, proof of stake is, is just the same model as we have in the traditional world, except that it goes through nodes and it's not much different. Proof of work is the best, blah, blah, blah. So that's question number one. How would you respond to that type of uh, remark? And also, since proof of stake seems to be the right consensus mechanism, does it make sense for Ethereum to transition as well, in your opinion, for the Ethereum 2.0? Yeah, so they're both uh, permissioned in the respect that you have to buy a resource uh, to play. And so uh, the proof of work people just assume that ASICs are always available and will always be commercially purchasable. Uh, so wait, I have no incentive if I'm an ASIC manufacturer to sell it to the general public. If mining is really a, a nice industry, then what I should do is use them internally, build a private pool, make a lot of money from mining, and then sell them after my uh, my uh, I've sucked out all that arbitrage out. The other thing is ASICs are patented more often than not. So that's not, a, that's not an open access chain. If somebody has a unique monopoly to produce the hardware that allows you to participate in a competitive way in the system, then how can you argue that that's somehow a morally superior system to uh, ADA on exchanges or you know uh, EOS on exchanges or Tezis on exchanges, any of these systems that are proof of stake? Because at least in the exchange side of things, there's always liquidity. There's always people that are willing to sell and it's a fungible asset. Whereas in the other side, it's an economy of scale system where it tends towards mass centralization. And the proof is in the pudding. Bitcoin's been running for 10 years and now less than 10 major operations control more than 51% of the hash power. And I can't play unless I spend hundreds of millions of dollars to compete with them. So, uh, so that's the, so for, if you're going to argue an egalitarian perspective, I think the thing that you can always buy a resource off the uh, exchange and there's high liquidity, it's much better than the invitation only club and the economy of scale and subsidized power and patented ASIC club. But the fact that we can't even get a concession that that's an issue from the proof of work people, it shows that there's an intellectual disconnect between reality and faith. You know, they, they, they just say, no, that's not even true. It's like, well, but that's what's happened. You know, the one area of proof of work where I do agree with is if you have ASIC resistance, then what you do is you inadvertently construct a gigantic cluster of GPUs and CPUs. So you build the world's largest computer or one of the largest distributed computers around. Now, the problem is you're only using it for one problem and that problem's useless. So one really sexy area of research is if you could couple ASIC resistance with useful proof of work, then you are doing something different from what proof of stake is doing. If the only problem you're trying to solve is I want to advance the state of a ledger, it's a game of efficiency. You should be mm -hmm. saying, which model gives me the lowest cost way of performing this activity, it's the most efficient way of performing this activity. You have one group saying, there is only one God and our system is so expensive it, 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 it ne and it never gets cheaper, by the way. As the price of Bitcoin goes up, the energy consumption goes up, that never changes. 
the the system is built this way by design. So eventually you'll be using more power than Canada, perhaps more power than the United States, depends on the power of Bitcoin. It's pretty crazy when you think about it. Uh, whereas proof of stake, power consumption has nothing to do with it. In fact, the incentive is the opposite direction. Make it as efficient as possible. So over time, uh, your energy consumption flatlines and you know basically stays at a negligible level. Uh, so if your only goal is doing that task of advancing the state of the system, proof of stake annihilates proof of work. And the only counter argument they can have is perpetual motion or it's not egalitarian or it's plutocratic. You say, hang on a second here. The resources that we use can vary over time. So to bootstrap the system, you can have a plutocratic system where the token is the resource that you use, that scarce resource to decide who gets to advance it. And those people have the strongest incentives to preserve the value of the system. So you've at least aligned incentives. Proof of work, it's not necessarily aligned. We'll get to that in a moment. Um, but you can also create a proof of merit. You can do all kinds of things in the uh, where certain actors who are doing beneficial things can get another token as a consequence of getting doing those things that also is used in the decision of who gets to advance the state of the network. So you can move to a multi-token proof of stake and not every token represents the same thing. You have this diversity and it's low cost to experiment with this when you have a proof of stake system as opposed to a proof of work system where it's really expensive to change and you lose all your security when you change your, your algorithm from one to the other. Now, in terms of incentives, Sometimes the, the mercenaries turn on Rome. Let's say you have two proof of work chains that have relatively the same hash power and you have enough hash power to have 51% control of one or the other. You actually have, if they're at the same price point, an incentive to destroy one chain. And the reason being is that you can go to markets, short sell the chain, 51% attack it, destroy it, make people lose all faith in it, make a windfall profit as you ride the markets down, and then switch all your mining power to another chain. It, you get to reuse all your mining power, your mining tokens of equivalent value. So the Goldfinger attack is incentivized by the existence of complex financial markets. And we've seen this actually in practice happen for smaller proof of work based tokens. So your, your miners are mercenaries in that respect. Uh, they're not vested in your system. That's the problem with all exogenous resources. They're with you only as long as it's profitable to be with you. And when they're not, they will leave immediately. With a proof of stake system, it's endogenous. It's inside the system. They can't leave. The, you know, the token's only valuable uh, if they're there and they're participating. So it actually creates a lock-in for your community and for your people. Um, now, useful proof of work and uh, you know, ASIC resistance, if you achieve this, then you're now doing different things. because You're saying, yes, we're getting consensus, but that's only a small part of it. We're also using this as a supercomputer for decentralized infrastructure. So, uh, so I, I had definitely have some grievances with proof of work. That said, it's a Marvel proof of work. You know, as we spent five years playing with it, understanding it. We even created our own proof of work protocols and things like NEPA pals, for example. So, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. And it's a really elegant piece of science. And it, by Bitcoin scale and adoption, it really does show you the power of that protocol. But overall, if you're only trying to do one thing, proof of, proof of stake just blows proof of work out of the water. And I really love how you framed it, Charles. You said we're not looking to make it as difficult as possible, but to make it as efficient as possible, uh, which makes a lot of right. sense. I mean, that it's just summarizes the whole thing. Opposite. Your, your incentives are to mine at the lowest possible cost, the lowest possible energy consumption. Get it to work on a Raspberry Pi if you can. So you actually get more inclusive hardware, more uh, lower cost operational cost, uh, lower energy consumption. That's your incentive in a proof of stake system. A proof of work system, your incentive is to maximize your hash rate by any means necessary. So any advancements you gain in uh, power efficiency, you just build more ASICs. You don't, you don't actually lower the energy consumption of the system. You just use the fact that you have lower energy costs to actually have more hash power. So you end up having 100 A6 instead of 10. And then you throw them away after 18 to 24 months as uh, things evolve. So there's this incentive to create a huge amount of electronic waste alongside that. Yeah, beautifully put, Charles. I really appreciate that. And just going back on one of the points you mentioned in the very beginning of the interview, you talked about choosing the right code, the right functional programming language. And a lot of the tech people, including a good friend of mine, Nicolas Raymond, shout out to him, who is a huge Scala fan, also appreciates the work on under Haskell. Could you tell us a little bit more about why you guys chose that language? And a lot of people say that it was the right choice 
uh, for actually achieving scalability. Yeah, I mean, the power of functional programming, and by the way, we've done Scala work as well. Uh, we wrote an Ethereum client in Scala, full node, and uh, it was only like 12, 13,000 lines of code. To give you some comparison, uh, Bitcoin C++ is like 120,000. So it's 10 times more concise and it's a more complicated client. So functional programming can be very concise. And that's the first core advantage of it is that you just have less code. And often code is read 10 times for every one time it's written. So, you know, if you, if you scale it out. So you want really concise, understandable, readable code uh, um, for maintenance, upgradability, and, you know, the understandability of it. Um, second, uh, there's this concept of testing. So when you use functional languages, especially paired with formal methods, you have all these tools like QuickCheck and other things that you can use that allow you to write code that's very secure, very high quality, and when bugs occur, they're easy to find. And third, the kind of developer you get when you focus on mathematically pure, elegant languages is generally a programmer who's very well educated, and not just in engineering, but in the theory of computer science. And so when you're talking about source material, like these complicated academic papers with lots of mathematical equations, it's really difficult to take that, throw that at a JavaScript developer or a Java enterprise developer or something. They'll be like, well, you know, I remember reading about this when I was getting my master's or I remember taking a class in this at senior year in school or something. You get a Haskell developer, you know, you know, Duncan has a PhD from Oxford in computer science. He's extremely comfortable reading these types of papers. So not only can we read them, we can criticize them. We can recognize holes in them. We can recognize that ideal functionality that's assumed is not necessarily going to work. So the, the engineers can actually push back on the scientists and force them into more realistic modes of thinking. So that's another happy accident of picking these types of languages is you're drawing from a talent pool that is uniquely qualified to write code that is very complicated. And there's no way to simplify this stuff. You're talking about Byzantine resistant distributed systems with cryptography uh, that also have an economic dimension to them. That is probably the most complicated code outside of aerospace stuff uh, that you're going to write in your programming career. And if you get any of it wrong, the, the system just DDoSes itself and the crypto doesn't work and you end up with a parity hack or so forth. So, you know, as a CEO, I feel a lot more comfortable that the people who are thinking about this stuff are qualified enough to be able to understand the nuances that they need uh, when we have to roll our own crypto. You know, the the first thing everybody tells you uh, is a warning is don't roll your own crypto. But unfortunately, we don't have that luxury because we're inventing the crypto as we go along to make these protocols work. If we don't have a VRF that works, we have to create our own, which means we have to roll our own crypto. Uh, you know, we've had to modify elliptic curve stuff for, uh, you know, for key erasure stuff. We've had to uh, modify ED2519 for HD wallets. I mean, these, this is not normal everyday uh, programming. This is like complex heart surgery on very delicate protocols that if you screw up, you introduce all kinds of attacks like side channel attacks and other things. So you need a special breed of developer who's very elite to be able to do this type of work. Um, and uh, people say, oh, well, no, you don't. Well, then, you know, look at all the hacks and flaws and, you know, how many things that have occurred over the last 10 years in our space as a consequence of people not knowing what they're doing. And it's just common sense, you know, when you get sick and you need surgery, do you want your butcher to do that? Or do you want your surgeon to do that? Why do you trust the surgeon with your life? Because that person spent more than a decade of his life or her life studying to become worthy of that. So similarly, why would you trust an amateur with your, your privacy, with your identity, with your money, these types of things? You should aspire to say that the system that you're using was built on bedrock it was built by really smart people who knew what the hell they were doing. I'm glad you made it as well. I believe every CTO on the planet would agree with you that finding the talent that can actually code with those specific languages is probably one of the most difficult tasks in the world. <laughs> they're quite well, rare. We did, it. we did it. I mean, we had to hire the guys who created the language. Uh, you know, that that helped. <laughs> that helps. <laughs> so, there's a lot we did. I, you know, we worked with the best and the brightest, well-typed Tweak and uh, others. They, they're great firms to work with. And um we have a lot of great in-house talent that we've accru accrued over the years as well. So, and we've had trained a lot of people too. Lars Brunius actually went 
held Haskell courses in Barbados and Ethiopia. And we spent years developing talent just to get developers who are capable of doing the things that we need to do. So this was a huge commitment and it was not for the lighthearted. Thank you so much for that, Charles. So the next question will be around the most exciting and upcoming technologies that will benefit the blockchain space. I know you had an interview the other day with the CEO of Messari, and basically you were talking about MPC, multi-party computation technology, but also quantum computing. Among all of these emerging technologies, what is the most fascinating to you? Yeah, you know, there's some cool stuff, uh, but if you want to realize the dream of Satoshi, there's some things you need to accomplish. So Satoshi's whole core premise, one of them was inclusive accountability. So the basic idea is that everybody checks each other. Everybody checks each other's homework. So if you assert that you've done something, I should have the ability myself to verify that what you've done is right. So uh, proof of work works this way. You know, you, the whole system, you, from you finding the, the magic hash to making the block to saying it's a legitimate block, you have all the batteries included as a full node to be able to have a single source of truth. The problem with that system is it's replicated. So basically, it becomes like a bacteria colony. Once you get too big, it kills itself, uh, or you mass federate. So what happens when your blockchain's at petabyte? And that will occur if we are successful. This is one of the reasons the core developers of Bitcoin kind of kick the can down the road and try to keep the block size as small as possible because they don't want to face that reality because they don't have a good solution at the moment to dealing with a, a petabyte scale blockchain. Uh, first off, nobody can check it. Even if it was a few terabytes, nobody would run a full node because they couldn't on a laptop, they couldn't on a desktop. They need to run a proper server to do that. Petabyte, you know, it's NSA or Google. You know, pick pick which one you want to be your blockchain server. Uh, so inclusive accountability is a difficult one to, uh, to capture, uh, especially as your computational resources to run things go up and your network resources, not just data. So SNARKs are a really interesting technology, the whole class of zero-knowledge proofs, because what they allow you to do is have a situation where you know it's right without having to see the whole thing. So uh, you basically say, oh, yeah, this coin I have is real and I never double spent it. Well, that's an assertion you're making, and you can produce a proof of that and no matter how big the system becomes, it can be many, many petabytes of size or exabytes or yottabytes, and how much computational power required to evaluate the entire ledger state. In fact, no one computer, supercomputer or otherwise could do that. You could generate a proof potentially uh, that could show that those tokens exist and they've never been double spent. So when you're a merchant and you receive that, you maintain that property of inclusive accountability where you know that you're dealing with an honest system uh, even though you don't have the whole system. So for your clique of the system, you're okay. So there's some projects like Coda Protocol and Halo and other things that are chasing that, that I think is probably the single most important long-term research stream for not just scalability, but preservation of a core economic ideology that we have, a core philosophical ideology, I should say, this concept of inclusive accountability. It's not necessary. I mean, if you're comfortable with uh, trusting somebody, then you can operate the systems. And that's kind of the world that EOS is moving into and Fabric lives in and so forth. But then what's the point of decentralization and this whole blockchain revolution? Why not just have a centralized database if, you know, if you, you're living in a world I trust Bob or trust Alice? You don't fix your problems of decentralization with centralization. You know, if you're committed to it, you have to do some cool things. But there's a lot of just good old fashioned work that has to be done about incentives as well. The social dynamics, the voting theory, how do you build a stable governance system? I think that's probably ultimately going to be the most meaningful work. This is something that the totality of the entire human race has never solved once in its existence. There's never been a perfect government. So it's pretty preposterous to say that we as an industry will somehow solve that problem uh, for blockchain, right? Because we are literally talking about removing the central authorities, the presidents, the deciders, and replacing them with a more direct bottom-up system. That's a totally different way of doing things. And historically, those experiments have failed. So uh, it's a super, super complicated thing. The good news is there's like emergent stuffs and, you know, social uh, uh, sociology and complexity theory and so forth that we didn't have those tools before and we didn't have the instantaneous movement of information or the ability to do mechanism design at the scale that we are doing. Uh, so there's more tools in our tool bag that give us at least an attempt to solve this mother of all problems, but it is an equivalent problem to building a perfect government at the end of the day. 
So you're going to have to accept that it's going to be an imperfect, unstable system with lots of issues year after year, which require lots of manual intervention and compromises and occasionally a Cincinnatus to come and reboot it. Uh, so that's uh, that's that's the, the stuff I'm going to be most interested in my 40s and 50s and 60s, the kind of the tale of my career. So right now I'm in the meat and potatoes mathematician mode where we get to do lots of really cool stuff in the science world that has definitive answers. And it's clear that something is better or is proven. Uh, but then that's the not so easy space where it's never clear if you've actually built the right system or not. As a final point there, there's a concept of latency. So decisions have this unfortunate consequence of it may seem like a bad decision today, but it may actually be the best decision long term. Uh, children have trouble with this, right? You know, say, do you want the cake? And they're like, no, they always want the cake when you offer them the cake, right? But if they forego the cake, they probably will make better decisions or maybe it's healthier for them or something. Well, similarly, there's a lot of analogies to that cake where there are things in the short term that seem like a good idea like printing huge sums of money, uh, you know, that's always seems like a good idea to politicians because it gives you a boost in the economy, a shot in the arm, but long-term you have to pay for it. You know, you have a debasement of your currency or these things and going to war, these types of things. Yeah. In the short term, it may seem like a good idea. In the long term, you have to rebuild the country. And after 20 years of occupation in Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, America is starting to learn that uh, its uh, its war culture is perhaps super counterproductive. It's been so expensive in blood and treasure and uh, damaged the moral character of the country abroad. So uh, it's that's the other problem with these governing systems is you can optimize them to allow you to make decisions in the short term or long term. If you optimize them for long term decision making, crises tend to destroy the system. You know, a plague breaks out or a war breaks out, and then everybody wants to throw the system away because it's too slow to respond. If you optimize them for the short term, you end up burning all your resources, goodwill, and value that you stored up and create a social debt. And then eventually it descends into totalitarianism and chaos. No one's found a satisfactory resolution for this yet. Slowly but surely is definitely the right approach. It kind of reminds me of the book, The Tortoise and the Hare, by the way, and uh, the tortoise ending up winning the race. But my next question is related to the ADA coin. And obviously, blockchain infrastructures have their own coin and token for different reasons. It could be for staking, consensus mechanisms, it could be for voting, uh, and many decentralized governance in general. But uh, what are the future utilities of the ADA coin? Will you be adding more utilities as you go so that people can see even more value and perhaps even win the hearts over of people in the traditional worlds? Yeah, I mean, it does everything that you'd want it to do. You can use governance as a service. You can use it to build utilities on the system. So it's a metering token. You can use it to issue assets. And so it's uh, kind of got a central bank function in that respect. It's a govern. It's a uh, voting regulator. So you can use it to participate in the, um, the funds of the system. It's a consensus regulator. So you can use it to decide who uh, advances state of the ledger. It's got a lot of utility. And you know the burden is on us to show the use and utility. So Shelley's all about decentralization and saying, hey, turning it from a static and federated to a dynamic and decentralized system. But Gogan, the very next update, which is coming sooner than people think, is uh, basically all about use and utility. Saying, OK, let's go to a system that can do lots of stuff for lots of different actors. And we already have those actors as partners, people like Beef Chain and work we're doing in Africa and so forth. And there they're, they're trying to solve real life problems like, hey, I want to make sure that the beef you're eating is, is good and that the facts on the label match reality. Uh, or, you know, maybe you're a farmer in Ethiopia and you want to get your fertilizer voucher and you want to do that in a fraud free way and be able to repay it in an easy way. So there's a lot of promise in these systems and just like the internet in the 90s like everybody knew it was going to be big but the exact model of how to get there you know you need the web certificate and the cookie and cryptography and javascript and the browser and even then you need the internet backbone to get better so we had to move from dial up to broadband and so forth and only then after we had had those foundations was it possible for people to actually really do great things you know amazon's first website the, the cadabra website to replicate that at that time required an extraordinary effort. You could build a massively better experience in 2002 uh, with, uh, you know, like two people, you know, because that's just how fast technology evolved. So all the dApps and DeFi of today, they're just proofs of concepts. 
and uh, the real stuff is coming once the infrastructure and the and the people behind that infrastructure get better. That's why I don't worry so much about this whole concept of first mover effect or something like that. It's like there were 19 search engines before Google. I mean, Microsoft had the largest and most powerful monopoly of any tech company in history. And now, where are they at in the mobile space? You know, and where are they at with the browser share when they had over 90% of browser share? Where are they at with you know developer adoption? People are right now doing iOS first and Android first before they even consider Windows. You know, it's devastating for them how they've lost those network effects in a very short period of time. So yes, network effect is powerful only up until when the paradigm changes or eventually people can build experiences that are fundamentally better than the experiences of the past. So uh, so you do need a token for these systems to behave well because it's a, it's a coordination point. And it's an incentive point to get people to do things. It's also a resource, a regulating resource for the system as a whole. Um, and uh, without it, you really can't get the system to solidify around w one cohesive policy, or else you'll just end up having 50 variants of the system and that they don't talk to each other and, and so forth. It also, it's, uh, it's a nice speculative instrument and it brings a different class of people into the, uh, into the ecosystem. And uh, eventually, it can become like a central bank as a whole. So it's it's a curious thing, you know. It's it belies definition. You know, regulators they they really like having nifty labels that they can put on things. Say, oh, this is a commodity. This is security. This is a currency. The problem with crypto is it's like a stem cell. You know, so it can become a heart cell. It can become a nerve cell. It can become a skin cell. So it's more of a functional regulation viewpoint of how are you using it? Are you using it like a security? Are you using it like a commodity or like a currency? It's probably a more realistic way of looking at it. But the problem is our regulations aren't set up that way. So, you know, it's like you just have to wait until new laws are passed or, you know, new interpretations come and kind of catch up. Um but overall, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a curious thing when you look at these tokens. Um, but I love how you uh, framed it in terms of being a coordination point. And I think people, because it's thanks to the projects like this and, and what you guys have, you know, in, in your milestones in terms of creating more and more value to these tokens that I believe we will shift away from the shareholder centric approach, where which is very inclusive, uh, exclusive, sorry, and creating a system that is a lot more inclusive. So uh, I'm very happy to hear that you have all these cool um, uh, projects in, in the near future. Yeah, you know, also that's a good point. It's that when you're talking about a share, you have this expectation of return and you do nothing. You just sit on your ass and say, I hope Elon Musk is going to do a good job with Tesla. Or, you know, I hope Sasha Nadella is going to do a good job with my Microsoft stock. And if they do, huzzah, I make a lot of money and I take a risk by, you know, gambling on their, their leadership and vision. With these, they're fundamentally different because you have equal access to the success of the system as the people who built the system. Uh, and uh, because of that equal access, you actually have a chance to either destroy its value by the, how you represent it or increase its value. Like if you're a really horrible person and you go around Twitter and Reddit and all these other things and oh yeah, I, I'm part of system X, yeah, all right. Then the fact that you're there actually turns people off and they leave and they don't want to adopt that technology. If you're a really good person, just by the fact you support it, brings value in. And that's unpredictable and it's dynamic. And so it's a bizarre thing when you try to model the value of these types of systems. And what ends up happening is people really want strongmen. They really want the great leader to take them somewhere. And then they start realizing that the great leader has no power to do that. Like here in the crypt in our own ecosystem, we have this big debate going on about the ITN, the incentivized testnet. And a lot of people are saying, Charles, just turn it off. And I was like, well, I can't. <laughs> it's got 1,200 state pools running in it. It's peer-to-peer. -peer. I can shut the IOHK nodes off, and then it would still have 95% chain quality. And they're like, yeah, but you surely can turn it off. And I was like, no, it's decentralized. <laughs> and that's the thing. And so, so they're not really they're not really natively used to this concept that nobody's in charge and that we actually have to work together, especially in a day and age where people are, are so inclined to disagree viciously with each other. So... Uh, so yeah, that's that's another thing that 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 kind of screws up the whole value assessment of it. Is that you know, and it's like a, it's almost like a a collaborative park where people can just show up and build stuff. It's like, and the more people who do that, the more valuable that place becomes. Like a bazaar, you know, where you know the more tents that are there, the more attractive the festival or event is. But it's only made valuable by the fact that other people are there. It's not made valuable by a central coordinating effort outside of the architecture of how the layout is or something like that. Burning Man is a great example of that. 
Burning Man is a great example. And I love how you also mentioned about the proof of concept for DeFi. There's definitely some overhype there, perhaps some underhype on security tokens, which I know you're involved with a lot these days. It's funny how, you know, us humans always tend to over-exaggerate or under-exaggerate things. But I know you don't have much, much time, Charles, um, but I would love to ask you like one more question about possibly what is the biggest breakthrough or story that you have that is meaningful for everyone watching out there and why this movement is so important. I know you had an amazing story in Mongolia that you shared in Davos. In Japan, you shared some amazing stories in, in Africa. But if you can give us like a, a really meaningful picture that, you know, shows why this is important, what we're doing on a daily basis, that'd be great. Well, you know, it's always nice to make it personal. Uh, you know, what's really amazing is that uh, generations are are starting to diverge a little bit. You know, it's it's almost like that uh, catcher, uh, the cat in the cradle song, or whatever it was. You know, Soon, I'm going to be like you, Dad. So you have kids, you you have multiple generations, and they kind of they kind of drift apart, and they don't understand each other. And eventually, they call them for Father's Day, and that's pretty much it. You see them a few times. But what's so cool about Cardano uh, has been that it's brought a lot of fathers and sons and moms and daughters and, and others back together. Like just recently, we uh, we had somebody whose uh, 13-year-old son got really interested in Cardano. So the dad got really interested in Cardano. And they're actually setting up a stake pool together. You know, it's little things like that that are just so amazing and meaningful. You know, uh, people have named their kids after Ada Lovelace. Uh, people have gotten Cardano tattoos. So we tend to think of these things only in terms of the price or use and utility or technological capabilities. And that uh, is blind to the amazing social power of belonging to a system where we really are starting to have a conversation about how should we live in the 21st century? You know, we're rebuilding the very notion of privacy and governance and making decisions about who should be in charge. Uh, and normally we don't get to do that in mass. Normally what happens is a war happens, somebody wins it, and then the winners get in a room like Yalta or you know the Bretton Woods Conference, and they basically map out what the world is going to look like on the back of that. Okay, so Napoleon got to do that, the British got to do that, America got to do that in the 1940s. But now in the 21st century, there hasn't been the Great War. But yet there's enormous social change. You know, people are taking to the streets. The economic systems are changing. The relationship we have with the government is changing. Our demands for transparency are significantly higher than they were in the past. Our demands for oversight, and checks and balances are significantly higher. We're no longer just tolerating in inequality or inequity. We're now saying, hey, the world needs to work differently. And the problem is there's a tool deficit, the tools of democracy and republics and communism and all these systems of the 20th century and before, they're not sufficient for what people actually want. And what we're starting to realize is blockchain is just not about money. It also has the potential to really redefine our relationship with our government, with our businesses and with each other. So what's so cool is to see that light turn on in people's minds. And it starts as like a father-son project or something. And they're doing a stake pool and then they start realizing that everything is connected and everything is interdependent and that the very things that they're doing here can actually give them a voice on how they should be treated and how their financial future should be and um, whether they have privacy or not or they own their own data or not and so forth. Uh, I think that's the most magical story that, and it's just great. And uh, you see it with the young, you see it with the old. There's nothing better in life than seeing old people who are really cynical become inspired again. You know, they, they've 70, 80 years old. They've seen so much. They've, they've gotten hardened and they've just been resigned that the world is going to work in a particular way and they have a hopelessness about them. And then suddenly this stuff turns on and they start realizing that it is perhaps not for them because they're too old to see it all the way through. Uh, but it uh, for their kids and their grandkids is a way out the way that they've always been looking for. Uh, it reminds me of a quote the Greeks had, and yeah, something like, uh, society grows great when old men plant trees whose shade they shall never sit in. And uh, that's wow. that's really the magic of this system. And we have one of them, that's Vassal. He's uh, out in Bulgaria, plants all these beautiful trees. They take half a century to grow. He's not gonna live long enough to see them, uh, but he's planting them for us and uh, the people that come after us. And so I think that's the single greatest story is that just it's bringing people together. It's starting conversations that we weren't allowed to have in the past. 
And it's giving us tools to offer meaningful alternatives without having to go to war or hand power to somebody that allow us to get out of these social problems that we're having. And if we get it right, the 21st century will be the best century in human history for people to live in. The freest century, the most transparent century, the fairest century, a century where we focus on human development instead of GDP, you know, a century where it's just, it's good to live and so forth. You're such a great storyteller. And, and you know, I, I wish everyone out there will be able to attend one of your seminars, one of your courses, modules, wherever you are, or even just talks because there's just a wealth of information that is so, so inspiring. Um, Charles, I know you guys have an awesome summit. You mentioned it at the beginning of the actual interview. If you don't mind just reminding us uh, about this summit that's coming up and any other things that you'd like to share with the community. Yeah, it's gonna be a great event. If you go to cardanosummit.iohk.io, um, and the, I believe the link will be in the show notes, uh, it's gonna be over 4,000 plus people. My goal is 10, let's see if we can get there. And uh, we'll have like Vince Cerf there, the, the Haskell committee's coming back. Stephen Wolfram's going to be there talking about the structure of the universe. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about governance, a lot about use and utility, a lot about regulation. We got a lot of people coming. We have some heads of state attending the, uh, or former heads of state attending the event. Uh, so I think former Prime Minister of Georgia is going to be there. There's a lot of really cool speakers. And of course, uh, I'll be talking about where we've gone. And the future of Cardano, we have some secret announcements that are going to be fun. So that uh, that's always going to be interesting. It's nice to do a one more thing every now and then. Uh, and uh, I think people are just going to enjoy the celebration. You know, Shelly was a long time coming, and we all worked for it. And we felt it was so important to put a flag in the ground and say Shelly shipped. And congratulations to the people who had so much faith and patience. And also to wish all the small business owners we've just created well and their pursuit of building up their businesses because these stake pools are actually small businesses and they have uh, there's so many of them all across the world. So it's uh, it's going to be a fun event. It's a two-day event, July 2nd to 3rd, and it's a virtual summit. I think we're using Meet You as the uh, platform. And uh, there's a lot of cool stuff that, uh, that I think people are going to enjoy. So check it out if you have the time. I'm sure they will. And, and Charles, like a huge thank you for rebringing faith, as you were saying, because a lot of the blockchain infrastructures, some people are starting to lose a bit of faith. And I think that this whole Cardano movement really re-injected energy and belief in the system again. So thank you so much for your hard work. And uh, for people who want to follow you, I know you're active on Twitter at IOHK underscore Charles, but are there any other uh, areas where people can contact you or read your work and yeah, the IOHK blog, if you just go to IOHK.io, um, is a really good place to see regular updates and follow uh, the official YouTube page of the company. Uh, but my Twitter is generally where I spend a, uh, you know, a lot of time just messaging people and broadcasting things. And it's also where I announce all my periscopes and YouTube videos. So that's a great place to start. But all the IOHK assets, our blog, our YouTube, uh, these things, definitely follow those because they give out such great information on a pretty regular basis, pretty much weekly at this point. Awesome, guys. So don't forget to actually follow Charles. Go to the blog. Check out the website as well. Go to the conference and get involved as much as you can because there's some amazing things in the pipeline. And uh, thank you so much, Charles, for all your time today. I know we went a bit over time, but to be honest, I could have added an extra hour of questions just based on what you were saying. Yeah. I could talk to you for hours, but really appreciate all the, the great insights. All right. Thank you so much, Alex. Cheers. 